Jane's almost home. We're next off. We're next off. Well, some of you have been there, haven't you? Good stuff. I love it. Uh, so uh, what gives you a sense of urgency? You know, is it when you're really hungry and, and uh, you get a little bit hangry? How many of you get hangry when you're hungry? Okay, be honest. Some of you have a sense of urgency when you need food. Uh, is it when you're a little late getting somewhere, so you're driving a little faster than you probably should be driving? Uh, some of you drive like it's urgent, even when it probably isn't urgent. And I used to be that way. My foot isn't quite as heavy as it used to be. In fact, I haven't had a speeding ticket in over 25 years. I'm not going to knock on wood or anything. But uh, I've been pulled over a few times, but they see my, my sweet, innocent face. And, you know, who could give that face a ticket, right? And we all have a, a sense of urgency when there's imminent danger involved. Okay, that's a for sure thing. I remember one time when I was a kid, I had this huge sense of urgency. I was out in our field playing wiffle ball with a friend. We had a little baseball field at our house, and, and it was out in the country, and it was right next to our, our sheep pasture. Uh, we used to raise sheep, and, and uh, my friend and I were out there, and then my little sister was tagging along, and she was there, and and they make her chase balls and stuff. So one of us hit a foul ball into the, the pasture, and I, I told my sister she had to go get the ball and uh, get it back to us. And so she climbs over the fence and, and gets over there, and then I see this ram coming towards her. We had this ram that, that was kind of mean, and if you weren't watching, he'd come and, and knock you over. And so I saw that, and I'm thinking, oh, no. My, really, my thought is I would be in so much trouble if my sister gets killed by this ram. So I, I ran and, and hurdled the fence, which was higher than I would normally be able to hurdle at that point. I was probably 12. My sister, I think, was 6 or 7. And I, I got there just in time to, to save her from the ram. So I came to the rescue. But really, like I said, it was more I was just trying to, to not be in trouble. So there was a sense of urgency with that for me but we all have times of urgency in our lives but let me tell you something else that we should be urgent about uh, but most of us aren't really that urgent about it if we're honest um, we should be urgent about knowing Jesus better okay if you are a follower of Jesus if, if you uh, call yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ you should have a desire to to urgently know him better and guys, I don't think it just should just be a casual desire to, to get to know Jesus when we have a chance, but an urgent desire that, hey, I need to know my Savior in a deeper and better way. And, and we are blessed with God's written word that has four different books that tell us all about the life of Jesus. It's the Gospels, of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And, and you guys have heard me say it many times, read the whole Bible, but don't get too far away from the Gospels. Keep coming back to the Gospels, because they talk about Jesus, the life of Jesus. And, and out of the four Gospels, one of the Gospels really has a true sense of urgency in the, the way it is presented. It's the shortest Gospel with 16 chapters, but it, it just doesn't beat around the bush. It's like, boom, here you know. Here's what you need to know about this man named Jesus. And, and so over the next several months, we're going to dig into this book um, called Mark and and try to learn a little bit more about this man named Jesus and, and not just learn about him but hopefully apply what we learn to our lives and so I'm excited I think it's going to be good stuff looking forward to it the title of the message today could be the title of the series because it's really kind of the gist of the series it's called you need to know Jesus uh, it, it's a simple and and true statement but Mark starts the book when it was time for Jesus to begin his ministry he doesn't mess around with much of an introduction it's just here we go let's do this okay this is urgent and so uh, those of you who are moms have had different kinds of births for your children if you've had more than one child and and some of you have had labor that lasted for days and and you thought man 
when's my child ever going to get there? Caleb's birth was like that. Our first child, it took a long time. And it was hard on me as a dad. You know, you moms think you have it bad. That Think about us guys, what we have to go through. I mean, really. Okay, moms who are watching, don't throw anything at the TV. I'm just kidding. Or at your phones, whatever you're watching on, don't throw your phones. Now, Olivia was, was more along the lines of, uh, it's time. Ready or not, here I come. And, and interestingly enough, that, that matches their personalities in real life, too. Uh, but Mark is a book that's like, here it is. Let's go. Let's start talking about Jesus. Let's not mess around. This is urgent. And so as you read Mark, there is an urgency to the writing of this book. In fact, the word immediately is used 17 times throughout the book. And so let, let me give you just a little background as we begin the series. Most scholars believe that Mark was the, the first book written out of the four Gospels. Matthew and Luke seem to use Mark as a reference for some of their writings. Some would put the writing as early as the late 50s A.D., and different views go all the way up to being written in about A.D. 70, shortly before the destruction of Jerusalem. Personally, I think it was probably written in the early 60s. Uh, it, it seems to be written to primarily a Jewish, or I mean a Gentile audience, because Mark explains Jewish customs and translates certain Aramaic words that a, a Gentile audience may not have been familiar with, and so we kind of get some clues for that. The author of the book is widely accepted as John Mark, who Peter declared as his spiritual son. And so we think that the book was written through the, the strong influence and witness of, of Peter, uh, one of the original 12 disciples. You may, you may remember that Mark was actually a source of division between Barnabas and Paul because apparently Mark had abandoned Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. And as a result, Paul didn't want to take him the next time they're going to go out. But Barnabas did want to take him. He wanted to give him another chance. And, and so Paul and Barnabas actually went their separate ways. Um, you know, it was a pretty heated type of thing. But Mark went with Barnabas. But there are later indications that the rift was healed uh, between Mark and Paul. And in 2 Timothy, Paul wrote about how Mark was very helpful to him. And so I, I think it's a, a neat little side point to the story is that God can use us even when we've failed him in the past. And we see that here in a huge way, and that this man who had once abandoned God's work now is the, the earthly author of one of the books of the Bible that, that we study from today. And I just think that's so awesome. Of course, we believe that God is the overall inspiration for the book. Mark was the human author, author so, so God used Mark to share this, this gospel message. So, don't ever try to use the excuse that God can't use you because of your past. Don't try to say that you've done too many things wrong. Uh, in fact, God will find a way to use your past if you let him. The only way God can't use you is if we don't allow him to use us. He, he never forces himself on us, but if we say, okay, God, God, use me. I'm here. He's going to find a way to do that. We talked a lot about that in our, our blessing series. Last week we answered, asked the question, are you ready to, to step up to the plate? And it's a question we need to continually ask ourselves. Are, are we willing to be used by God? Now, in the past 30 or 40 years, particular attention has been given to the style of writing of the, the book of Mark. It, it has a very distinct literary style to it. It's written in a narrative form, and in some ways we don't do it justice by breaking it up each week. The, the narrative tells the story from the, the beginning to the end, and, and in fact, if you have an hour or two this week, I, I would encourage you to just sit down and read the whole thing in, in one setting. It gives you kind of a, a different perspective of the book. So as we work our way through the book, I see several main groups of people who interact with Jesus. There, there is disciples, his, his closest disciples. There are the, the crowds who follow him and, and listen to his teachings and, and watch his miracles. Uh, there are the Jewish religious leaders who are skeptical of Jesus from the very beginning. And then there are various individuals who Jesus interacts with. And all of these groups have, have different kinds of responses to Ju Jesus. Some are very positive responses, some are, are, are not positive responses at all. And so as we look at the various responses that these groups have, it begs us to, to decide for ourselves, you know, how am I going to respond to the message of the book? How am I going to respond to Jesus? And one of the responses is to be a follower of Jesus, okay, a disciple 
Uh, the word for disciple is methetes. And, and usually we say that a, a disciple is a, a follower of Jesus, but I would say that it doesn't just mean follower. It also means learner. Um, so a true disciple of Jesus doesn't just follow Jesus. He continues to learn about Jesus. And then I think the true disciple of Jesus does what Jesus did. Okay, He or she follows in the footsteps of Jesus and, and learns, and, and, then, and that leads to action. That is so important. And so let's get started this morning. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, the, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Okay, boom. Here we go. Okay, we're off to the races. The, the, the gospel uh, means good news. And, and so it is the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And, and Mark doesn't mess around. He says right here in verse 1 that Jesus is the Son of God. It's like, okay, let's get this out from the beginning. And, and so what I think Mark is doing here, he's making a statement. This is who Jesus is. I'm declaring this. And then throughout the rest of the book, he's, he's going to show us how Jesus is the Son of God and, and what that should mean for us. So he declares this is who Jesus is. Now let's work through and prove it. Okay, let me support my proclamation. I also wanted to point out that the word Christ in verse 1 is the, the Greek translation of Messiah, uh, which is a Hebrew word meaning anointed one. So Jesus is the, the Son of God the Messiah, the anointed one, okay? And, and kings in the Old Testament, they were set apart symbolically through being anointed with oil. So by identifying Jesus as Christ, Mark indicates that he is the one who fulfills the centuries-old Jewish expe expectations of a coming Messiah, okay? He is the anointed king they've been waiting for. And then as we begin the chapter, we're introduced first to, to John the Baptist, and I think that's, that's done right away to connect things to the Old Testament. Mark gives a quote, first from the book of Malachi, and then a quote from the book of Isaiah. Uh, it's kind of Mark's edited version of those scriptures that, that speak of Elijah, who is to come to prepare the way for the Messiah, and, and Elijah, that Elijah is John the Baptist. And so he's showing that John the Baptist and then Jesus are the fulfillment of scripture. The, the Old Testament is leading up to this point in history, okay? So verses 2 through 8 are primarily about John, but they're, they're setting the stage for Jesus. And, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on those verses, but John taught a message of repentance of sins and preparation for the one who would come after him. But he would never, never wanted to exalt himself. He knew his purpose, and that was to prepare the way for Jesus. And that, that's exactly what he did. He, he never um, went off the road from that path. And then in the next scene, we jump right into the actual bapti baptism of Jesus by John. And remember, Mark, he doesn't mess around. The, uh, here we go. This is urgent. And in this scene, we have a direct confirmation from God to Jesus that he is proud of his son. Okay, and I, I think that was very carefully included to show that, that Jesus was from God, uh, according to, to Mark here. And so starting in verse 9, it says, At that time... Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. So Mark declared in verse 1, this is about Jesus, the Son of God. And, and now as Jesus enters the story, God directly speaks to Jesus. He says, you know, I'm, I'm pleased with you, Son. You know, we're not certain whether others could hear that voice or if it was just Jesus that could hear the voice, but the message is clear. Okay, you are my son. I love you. I'm, I'm pleased with you. And, and, you know, it's a message that dads have declared to their children all, all throughout history. Son or, or daughter, you know, I love you. I'm proud of you. Y you've done well. And, you know, for those who have never got that affirmation from your dad, this is hard, really. It's kind of hard to wrap your minds around it. It's hard to picture this kind of heavenly father that would be so proud of his son. So you have kind of a lot of things to overcome, but, but it can be done. And, and so it's, it's neat to see that happen. But, but dads, it is so impo important to aff affirm your kids. Okay, let them know how much you love them and how proud of them you are. And, and it's, it's really never too late to do that even if they're adults now. And I think God was pleased, not just about this very moment, but God had the ability to look ahead and, and know what was coming. 
uh, for his son. He knows what Jesus is going to have to go through. He understands what Jesus is going to be facing for the next couple years, and, and, and he's pleased with his son. And so this is important to see that God himself is declaring Jesus as his son. And then chapter 1 jumps immediately to the temptation of Jesus in the desert for, for 40 days. But it, but it only talks about it for one verse. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke, they expand on that story. But Mark just wants us to know that it happened. Okay, it was a, a preparation time for his ministry. And, and it was a time where Satan tried to knock him down because he, he knew what was coming. But it was 40 days without food or water. So it was a time to fully rely on his heavenly father. And then we have the very first words of Jesus recorded by Mark. And, and this is important, I think. But John the Baptist, he, he'd been put in prison. It was time for Jesus' public ministry. And, and Jesus was in Galilee, and, and he began to declare this message in Mark 1.15. The time has come. He said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Okay, that's what John had been saying. Repent. Now, now Jesus is here. It says, repent and believe. And so history was leading up to this point in time. In fact, the whole story of the Bible in the big picture, it's a redemption story. And in God's perfect timing, the Savior of the world is here. It's time to repent. It's time to believe it. The Messiah you've been waiting for is here. Now, there's been a lot of debate through the years about what the kingdom of God means and was it fully here at the arrival of Jesus or was the fullness still to come later? And I, I would say yes to both. Jesus ushered in the kingdom of God in many ways. Um, but he also at times refers to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven in the future tense as well. So, so I think yes and yes, the kingdom of God was here through Jesus and it will come in its fullness when Jesus comes back again one day. Okay, let's keep moving on. So the first people we come across, you know, remember we talked about these different people that Jesus interacts with. The first group that has to make a decision about what to do with Jesus are some fishermen. Okay, Simon and Andrew and then James and his brother John. And so let's read that section in, in verse 16 through 19. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, and they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Okay, the, the response to Jesus was immediate. When he asked them, okay, guys, do you, I want you to follow me. They, they did that. And they gave up a lot, okay? They left their livelihood. They, they left kind of a, a sure thing of, of fishing and went to an unsure thing. And, and I don't think that meant they had no idea who Jesus was before this moment. In fact, if you read all four Gospels, there are clues that they did know Jesus before this. Um, but they, they still had to make the decision on, on whether or not to make this huge life change, okay? Knowing who Jesus was doesn't make that decision easier. I know two families who, who made the decision to be missionaries in Taiwan soon after college. And, and in fact, I was friends with them that we're in the same campus ministry together. And, and they're still to there today, both families, over 25 years later, just spreading the gospel message of Jesus. And, and that long-term commitment to serving Jesus in another country, that's, it's just amazing to me. Um, th those kind of people are my heroes of the faith personally, but, but these families knew that, that people in Taiwan urgently needed G Jesus and somebody needed to go. Now remember, we think John Mark got a lot of his information from Peter, who's also called Simon. So Peter was with Jesus from the, the very beginning of his ministry. Okay, He was an eyewitness to most of the things that, that Jesus did in the last years of his life here on this earth. And then in, in the account of calling the first disciples in the book of Luke, chapter 5, it kind of gives us some extra details of the story. Jesus first asked Simon if he could use his boat to do some teaching from the water, and then he, he told them to, to throw their nets out into the water, and they, they caught a ton of fish. And Peter's first, first response to this was basically, Lord, I, I'm not worthy uh, of you to do this for me, okay? I'm a sinner, Okay, you should go away from me. You should help somebody else. I, I really don't deserve this. And, and that's when Jesus told him to come be fishers of men. And, and he immediately responded. 
And Peter and the other disciples' lives would never be the same after that day. You know, when they said yes to following Jesus. Okay, Lord, we'll, we'll come with you. And here's the thing. When you've been introduced to Jesus, you have a choice to make. You have to decide, okay, how am I going to respond to that? And, and nobody else can decide that for you. And so these first disciples, they chose to follow him. And, and they had no idea, to be honest, how uh, difficult their lives would be and how different their lives would be and what was to come. But there was something about this man named Jesus who th they were just drawn to, and uh, uh, they'd seen enough to say, okay, <coughs> we will follow you. Now, if you're already a follower of Christ, you still have choices to make. Okay, you, you might sense God calling you to do something right now. And, and the temptation will be to say, I'll, well, I'll do that later. Or, or when I have time, or, or when I have enough money, or when my situation changes, or, or when I'm a little braver, when I know a little more, uh, or anything else. You can come, you know, maybe when the weather's better. Our minds are going to come up with some excuse always to say, I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm ready to do that, whatever that is. But don't you think that if God calls you to do something, he can take care of the details immediately? Yeah, I do too. Okay, as we move on in chapter 1, Mark, Mark begins to share some of the miracles that Jesus performed. He jumps right into miracles and starts off by telling about a man in the synagogue who had a demon, and, and Jesus drove the demon out of him. And it's interesting to note in, in verse 24, we're going to read in a minute, that the demon knows who Jesus is. He says, you know, I know who you are, Holy One of God. And so here, here's the passage, starting in verse 23. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were also amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. So it was quickly evident to the people here that the, the teaching of Jesus was, was different than other teachings. He had an authority uh, about his teachings. There was just something different. And he was able to back up these things by performing miracles. And it says they were amazed. I, I hope that we're amazed by Jesus. Because he truly is amazing. He's, he's so incredible. And I think the danger of being a Christian for a long time is that you start to lose that, that sense of amazement. That, that sense of, of wonder and, and awe of Jesus. But you know, when you think about it in reality, the, the more we get to know him, the more we should be amazed. Let's be amazed by Jesus. And then the next verses, they talk about many other miracles that Jesus did, including healing Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. And, and we're going to talk more about miracles in coming weeks. But, but I wanted to touch on, on the, last sec um, yeah, the last section of chapter 1 before we run out of time today. Um, starting in verse 35, listen to what it says. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let's go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Okay, this is actually the first of three times that the book of Mark refers to the prayer life of Jesus. And so from this time on, in Jesus' life until the time of his death, it, it's going to be crazy. And he knew it. And he knew that in the midst of his craziness that it, his life was going to be, he had to take time to be with his father. You know, for Jesus, the best time was early in the morning when, when everyone else was, was still sleeping. And he knew that spending that time with his father was, was more important even than sleep. And I, I would think, you know, if it was important for Jesus, who was perfect, to spend time with his Father, how important is it for us, who aren't perfect, to spend time with our Heavenly Father? You know, he needed to refuel, and, and so do we. And, and don't get me wrong, prayer doesn't make everything perfect in your life. 
but I think it helps equip you to handle the things going on in your life. And it helps you to, to allow God to, to be able to walk al alongside of you or ahead of you, and you can follow it. And, and it helps build that relationship with God. And, you know, as a church, one of the most important things that we can do is to be a church of prayer. In fact, I don't think we will ever function at our full capacity as a body of believers if we are not a people of prayer. We'll not be unified like we need to be. We'll not be able to discern God's will for our church like we should be able to. It starts with prayer because the power of prayer is incredible. Jesus knew the urgency of prayer. Prayer was, was the fuel for Jesus to be at full capacity in his ministry. Did you catch that? Prayer was the fuel for Jesus to be at full capacity in his ministry. As God the Son, Jesus knew that he needed to be fully connected to God the Father, and that happened through prayer. We also need to be urgent about talking to our Heavenly Father. I'm going to pray in a minute. But as we begin this series, I, I hope that the book of Mark will begin to, to, first of all, reinforce in your mind who Jesus is, if you already know Jesus. But I also hope that you're going to learn new and, and exciting things about Jesus as well and, and, and uh, urgently be, be ready to say, man, I, I need to do something about this. I, I don't want to just hear it. I, I want to do. And the truth is that when you truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, it should affect your response to him as well. Okay, think about that. Nothing should ever be the same again. Who is Jesus? He's the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Y you need to get to get know Him. It's urgent. It's that important. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that all of us will have that desire to get to know you better, not to be content with where we're at in our walk with you, but to be excited and, and, and to, to want to know and grow and learn and draw closer to you. And Lord, I, I pray that we'll be ready for next steps that that would lead us to, whatever that looks like for us, and that we're ready to say, okay, yeah, this is good stuff. Let me go do something. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your word that we can learn and study and grow from. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So I encourage you to spend time getting to know Jesus better this week. Okay, Get to know him with a sense of urgency. Okay, Get to know him better through his word. Get to know better through uh, prayer. Get to know him better through people, but have a sense of urgency about getting to know him better, and then seek to be more like Jesus in the way you live your lives. You need to know this man named Jesus. He will change your life. So thank you for joining us today again, and have a great week.